<laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, this is quite daunting being here today amongst friends, colleagues, a whole lot of people from a wide range of diff different disciplines. Um, I hope we're going to have a bit of fun this afternoon just talking about design, the VNA, and the bigger effect that design can have in society. I'd like to welcome Mike Press and Hazel White, who are going to be joining us, joining me today. They know what they're talking about. I'm just a beginner. So we've got some real experts here today. Um, I'd love to know where all of you are, have come from. You know, how many of you are doctors in the sort of nurses, people directly involved in patient care? How many are from the creative world, art, design, um, engineering? <laughs> Nobody? A few? Oh, great. Thanks. Um, it's lovely to see we've just got a real mix of people here today, and we're going to try and take you on a little journey, tell a few stories in relation to quite a lot of stuff we've been doing for the last two or three years. Yep. Um, I, I'm quite a selfish sort of person when I think looking into the future at 20 years' time. I'm going to be getting very close to 80. <laughs> And, um, but this is my daughter looking into the future. Um, things are going to change dramatically, I would suggest, in the way we actually practice as healthcare professionals and our relationship with the patients that we, we care for. So there's, a, there's a, a, a future that is going to change rapidly. It is changing as we speak. I don't know what this is going to be, but I think we can look at ways that we can actually optimize this for all of us long term. Um, I've been on a personal journey, and it's a journey that's linked to a lot of you in the audience here today, that started probably about five years ago, where we as doctors um, are asked to reflect on our practice. How many of you have to reflect on what you're doing? It's a, it's a kind of thing you do every now and then. And a few years ago, I reflected on what I do as a, an ENT cancer surgeon and looking into the future. And I think my reflection at that stage was that I don't think we're going to come up with all the big solutions to our real healthcare challenges through our current model of working, of looking at science as a solution for a lot of our, our problems. There's not going to be a new pill or a new operation that's going to solve the problems of ageing, of loneliness, of obesity, mental health disorders. People are living in circumstances of social deprivation. We need to think differently as to how to solve these big problems. And that's where I took myself on a wee journey. We have met up with Mike and Hazel and with a lot of you. And we've had a lot of fun in the last few years actually looking at different ways of approaching some of the problems that we have. And the focus of today, I think, is centered around VNA Dundee. How many of you have been in the VNA? Great. And? It's wonderful. I mean, it's just fantastic. So I think we in a great place, at a great time, and we have fantastic opportunities to do things differently. These are just some of the components of what VNA is trying to show to us from a design perspective. A lot of our discussion today that Mike and Hazel are going to give to you is focusing on service design. And this is a, 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 a mindset, a set of tools and methodologies that I knew nothing about a few years ago. And I would suggest to you is an extremely useful way of thinking. I think the VNA is going to be all about mindset change, culture, changing these, just the way we do things. Um, if we look into the future, where are we at the moment? I think we're in a sort of slightly messy phase at the moment where digital technologies are coming in. They are definitely going to influence um, healthcare longer term. Oop, oh, back on again. This just clicks off every now and then. Um, so we, we're in this sort of era at the moment, artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, biomedicine, all this sort of stuff, it's all coming, it's going to come quite quickly, and we need to be clever in the way we deal with this. And I, the, what I've learned in the last few years is that you can do this through getting different disciplines together to solve a problem. And this is just a case in point, um, an example of a group of medical students, design students, plus their um, academics that are supporting them, 
looking at our A&E department. Anybody from A&E here? Okay. Um, the waiting room experience in an A&E department is not great. Uh, would I be right? Yeah. So a group of a mix of students are given a challenge to redesign the A&E experience for, pa for patients coming in. And I don't know if many of you have been down there recently. It's changed quite dramatically. There's much better wayfinding. There's a nice children's play area. Just a completely different environment. So we've been doing a lot of this, and it works. It really does work in mixing up different disciplines, giving them a challenge, and coming up with some solutions. We did a great time nationally in Scotland with people like Catherine Calderwood who have brought in realistic medicine as a philosophy of change for what we do as doctors, nurses, all our healthcare providers. And for those of you that don't know anything about realistic medicine, I'll very briefly give you its key points. This, when I read about realistic medicine for the first time, I felt an emotional response to it. This is what I wanted to go into, become a doctor. And I think it would be the same for a lot of our nursing colleagues and, and, and other people who are carers. And it's about changing a style. It's getting away from paternalism. It's personalizing care as a, a person goes through a journey in their health care. It's about reducing harm and waste. The, we over-investigate and we over-treat people particularly in the, towards the end of their life. How many of you have experienced that with loved ones? I'm sure, big, big problem. Um, and we focus too much on outcomes that matter to our healthcare services, in other words, waiting times targets, as an example, rather than what outcomes matter to people. Um, we, we need to work more on what people's expectations are in managing risk, and, and really, the, the bit that we're in at the moment is being innovative. And I think design can be one of the great ways of getting us together in solving problems from an innovative, creative perspective. So, this is the design version of realistic medicine. And Michael and Hazel will elaborate on this. And I think, I hope by the end of today, You'll have a feel for empathy, shared decision-making, personalizing journeys for people as they come through our service, looking at sustainability, what patient experience is all about. <coughs> Taking risk. We have to take risks in the way we come up with prototypes for new systems and services for our patients and empowering people better to actually particularly take care of themselves in, 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 in a more in a community setting rather than in hospital. So I'll stop there, and I'd like to hand over to Mike and Hazel. I've learned so much from Mike and Hazel, and I hope by the end of today you'll go with the same feeling that, yes, there's something different we can do. Mike. Thank you very much, uh, Rod. Uh, good afternoon. And thanks for that introduction. Rod, I can only be a bitter disappointment to you all from now on. Um, maybe if you learned a few things this afternoon, that, that would be great. That would be a great takeaway. Um, but we also have learned a massive amount from... Uh, from Rod and from other colleagues, some, many of whom are in this room. So, um, Hazel and I run a company called Open Change. We are a service design and innovation company based in Dundee, and we tend to work mainly with the public sector and third sector organizations. And what Hazel and I will do between us in about 20 minutes is to address these three questions. First of all, what is design? How do we think, what do we think design is? Um, what is service design? Because service design is the discipline which is already beginning to change government, is beginning to change public services throughout the world, is beginning to change healthcare. And how can we use design strategically in health and social care? What are there, what examples of best practice are there? Um, so let's start here. Let's start with uh, Catherine Calderwood, the Chief uh, Medical Officer for Scotland. And right at the start of her 2014-15 annual report, the first report on realistic medicine, she opens with this question, how can healthcare professionals release their creativity and become innovators, improving outcomes for people they provide care for? And we would argue that one of the many ways that that can happen 
is by taking design and creativity seriously, embedding it in the education of all health and social care practitioners, and applying its tools and methods within the domain of health care. So what does design mean to you? It, it means lots of different things. Design is buildings, design is chairs, design is uh, clothing, design is consumer electronics and so forth. But actually, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just one tiny aspect of what design is. Um, let's look at three terms. Three terms that mean very, very different things and are often confused. Creativity, innovation and design. Creativity is the process of generating original ideas that have value. The emphasis should be on those last three words, that have value. We can all come up with original ideas, but do they have value to the wider world and to other people? Innovation is the implementation of those original ideas that have value. And design is a way of thinking that harnesses creativity to innovate. Design is a way of thinking. It's how we think about people. It's how we think about problems. It's how we think differently to make positive, relevant change happen. That's what design is. We confuse design often with how things look. Design is styling. Design is about graphics. It's about fashion. No. A man called Steve Jobs, who was the co-founder of Apple, said design is not about how things look. Design is about how things work. Um, and that can be a health service. It could be a health service provider. It could be a government department. It could be an organization. It could be anything. It's how things work, not how things look. Then, so what is design thinking? It's an emphasis on understanding the needs of people who use and deliver products and services. So it's understanding people. And it has these four elements to it. It's human-centered. It's about empathizing. And a huge amount of design is about understanding people. It's about seeing the world through other people's eyes. It's about prototyping. It's testing things in the physical. It's trying things out. And in those terms, it's about being experimental. It's about being collaborative. The best quality of ideas are the ideas that come out of as diverse a group of people who experience that problem area that you can pull together. So it's about collaboration, and it's a bias to action. Right? It's doing, experimenting, not just talking, not just writing policy documents. It's about trying things out. I had to visit a friend in the Whittington Hospital in North London over the summer, and I was reminded of this actually quite pioneering project in hospital design at the Whittington. Um, they wanted to develop a new hospital pharmacy, so they spent actually only a few days prototyping and experimenting and doing walkthroughs rather than spending weeks and months of getting an interior designer and an architect to draw up plans they did this in about two days with large bits of cardboard and doing walkthroughs and then turned it into this it's one of the most effective pieces of hospital design simply because of the process and because it included the people who were going to use it. Um, design has a process behind it and just very, very quickly it has four parts to it. We call it a double diamond. The first part is discover. So what's happening? What's happening now? Um, and we are often trying to immerse ourselves into other people's lives or involve them in the design process. The define phase is what are the problems? Then the phase we go into is the phase that many people actually start with, where they think, oh, we know what the problem is, we're going to come up with a solution. But they haven't actually discovered the context of it, and they haven't defined what the problem is. But there's an assumption that they know what the, what the problem is. So we co-develop lots of possible solutions, 
And finally, we prototype and test. But the reality of the design process is that all the time you're going back and forth and trying things out. It's not linear. Right? It's a cyclical process that we go through. So design is about finding the right problems to solve. Are we actually solving a real problem? Who is this a problem for? Is it a problem for people who are delivering healthcare? Is it a problem for people who are receiving it? And it's bringing people together to co-create better ways of working. So it's bringing together, as Rod said, people from different disciplines. And that's really important, and that's great that we have people from engineering, from design, from medicine and elsewhere. But the people who know more about a problem domain than anyone else are the pr people who experience it. Are your users. That's a phrase we use. You'd think of them as patients. Or citizens. I'm actually delighted that a particular group of people are here in the audience because they've actually applied creative thinking to a problem that affects them. Because as we know, we have a massive problem in the city, in this country, in terms of um, mental health and drugs. Colleagues here from Recovery Dundee have done an immense amount of really valuable creative work. Why is it creative? Why is it effective? Because they know what the problem is. And they're working in partnership with other, other people to try and solve that. So that's what design is about. It's putting people right at the heart of the creative process. It's changing mindsets to encourage creative thinking. The mindset of creative discontent. Yes, we should be discontent about many aspects of the world around us, but we also have to be constructive. We have to create alternatives to get us out of problems. Well, is it important? It helps organizations learn quickly. We have a huge amount of evidence for that. It encourages a diverse input, and it generates solutions that are innovative, not just incremental, and it puts the people that you serve right at the heart of that process. Okay, I'm going to talk you through a few examples of um, how we've applied this process, um, mainly in healthcare and how other people have done so too. So as Mike says, we're based in Dundee. Do you know where the Phoenix pub is? Yeah, there's a little lane down the side of that. We're just up the end of that. Do come in and visit us. Um, and it's about putting people at the centre of change, but also that means changing organisations as well. So we work on quite a big scale. We've worked with um, Dundee City Council, which has 6,000 employees, taking them through a process of thinking differently about how they do it. We've recently been, well in fact we still are working with Historic Environment Scotland, um, who look after all the ancient monuments, castles, conserved buildings and stuff, and taking them through a change process as well. But the ones I'm going to talk about particularly today are health related. So we first got to know Rod two years ago and we offered to do a day session with some consultants, with some medical students, with health service managers, just how, thinking about how you could think differently using design. And we did um, what we called, at the time, Safari but we've since decided that that's a bit of a colonial term. Um, so we call it a walkabout. I know you do walkabouts in the health service, but this is a slightly different version of it. And we all got together, and we literally walked the corridors of nine wells, but people had specific tasks. So, for example, they maybe had um, to go to the fracture clinic, or they had to go to dermatology. Um, we didn't actually go right into the clinics, because that would have taken too much clearance, but it was actually just to go and sit, you know, come in from level seven and find your way somewhere and observe what was happening around about you. What were the messages that you were receiving about the hospital? What were you being told, etc.? How clear was it? How easy was it to navigate around as a lay person who's never been in nine wells before? And that was really, really insightful because most of us, when we go into work, even if it's us going down the lane behind the Phoenix, we tend not to look around and notice because it's very, very familiar and we don't think about how someone else experiences it. 
And then we also mapped people's journeys. So in this case, this was somebody going to dermatology and all the points where they could get lost, confused, and the messages that they were being given and how that could be improved. But what was really great about that particular day was somebody who's actually in this room, Phyllis, took that an awful lot further as part of the Scottish Government's health literacy demonstrator. Now, most of you know the answer to this. I show this slide of, um, all over the place. What's Ward 25? Eyes, yeah, ophthalmology. Because if you were sight impaired, that's the only place you'd be going, isn't it? You wouldn't be coming here to go to the children's hospital. You wouldn't be coming here because you had cancer. You wouldn't be coming anywhere else. Um, you know, why is it only ophthalmology that is in a way that's clear to see? It's seeing somebody by one diagnosis as a very one-dimensional thing. I don't know what the statistics are for people who are sight impaired coming in and what they're coming to do in different things, but this is assuming that they only need to see one ward. You know, so somebody's actually thought about that and designed it carefully, but designed it not knowing or not thinking that if you're sight impaired, you're a whole human being with all the different things that everybody else has as well. We also did um, a session with quite a large group of clinicians um, when realistic medicine was um, introduced and getting some feedback. And one of the things we did was we brought in patients um, to talk to clinicians about their experience and to map it out. And this fantastic drawing was done by a GP, I think. Am I right? Talking to someone with cancer who was explaining what their journey had been through um, through the diagnosis and through different bits of treatment, etc. And it all fell apart at a certain point where they had to go to out of hours. And they were, you know, all the information wasn't there and you know, it wasn't the specialist who treated them. And one of the clinicians said in this event, it had not really occurred to me before, that actually I think patients get gold star treatment when they're in my clinic. I actually don't know what happens to them when they walk out the door and what happens in those in-between bits. But that's the patient's experience. The patient's experience is not the 10 or 20 minutes in with the specialist. The parent's experience is living life with cancer, whether that's out of hours, whether it's at home with their family. That's their journey. It's not just that little atomized bit. So again, we use lots of tools like empathy mapping, trying to put people in the shoes of patients. The gold standard is actually to talk to patients themselves and get them involved in the design. So we've worked with the um, dental school um, so that when they're going out to do community work, that's actually quite new to the patients. So for, for example, if they're going to Castle Huntley um, to do clinics out there, actually putting themselves in the shoes of a prisoner at Castle Huntley and trying to imagine what they hear from authority, what they see around them, what they feel, what their fears are, and so that they empathise when they go there so that they're actually, as far as they can be, thinking how that patient's feeling. And again, we've done this all over the world. This is at the Gasman Institute in Kuwait, actually getting a whole range of people from lab technicians to GPs to think creatively about what the experience is for people who are coming to the clinic with diabetes, what their hopes and fears are. And that also helps explain why they may or may not comply with treatment. And that was one of the pieces of work that first took forward as well with the health literacy thing, looking at how, you know, why people behave in certain ways. Um, they did a fantastic project where they um, brought adult learners from Perth and Kinross Council, gave them a typical appointment letter and then shadowed them coming into Nine Wells for an appointment. And things with appointment letters, um, the first paragraph might tell you where your appointment is, but further down it says, but come 20 minutes early, because we need to take some tests. If literacy is not your thing, that's quite likely to be missed. The appointment is at Tayside Children's Hospital. If you come into Nine Wells on public transport, you go past the entrance to the children's hospital and then you have to be signposted from inside. 
there's all bits that can delay you on your journey. You're already late because you didn't realise that you had to turn up 20 minutes early to get test results. So there's all sorts of points that actually you might just turn back. I'm late. I'm going to be made a fool of when I turn up there. The receptionist is going to be cross. It's actually not worth it. I'm just not going to go. That's where some of your did not attends come from. Or when you get there, you're so stressed because you've actually turned up late that whatever the clinician says to you, you're actually too cognitively overloaded to take it in. So then you don't comply with the advice that you've been given. And that's just because of the way your letter's written. But if you ask people why letters are written that way, they'll say, oh, it's a legal thing. We just cut and paste from other things. But actually, you know, because we don't want to get it wrong, this text's all been approved. But actually, if you drill down into that, I don't know that that's true. So we've done stuff as well with uh, public health around healthy weight, setting people um, tasks to do like we did in Nine Wells. In this particular case, these people are going out to see how easy it is to walk a daily mile, which actually is remarkably much easier than you might imagine. One of the other tasks we gave people was, you've got two toddlers under five in a double buggy. It's raining, they're fractious, and they're hungry. And you've got a pound go and find them something healthy to eat because that's lots of people in Dundee's reality and do you know what? it's impossible it's absolutely impossible because we live in an obesogenic environment that sells cheap um, nutritionally poor food I mean it's all at the front of shops you know the, to actually go and get something that had any nutritional value is almost impossible and yet we give people advice you know eat five a day, etc., etc., and they can't do it. They actually can't. It can't be done. Um, we've also been working with um, NES in the Leadership Links programme, teaching some of these methods to leaders so that they can actually go out and do them with their team. One of the best bits that came out of that was empathy mapping. We asked people to empathy map a colleague that was difficult. Um, Actually, a number of people went back saying, I actually know how to solve this now. I know why things are difficult for them. Now that I've put myself in their shoes, I can see why they behave like that and I can also see what the solutions are. But a lot of what we do is about democratising conversations, putting people on the same level, whether they're patients, whether they're clinicians, whether they're other allied health professionals, so that everybody can contribute to that conversation and see it from different points of view. And it's about collaboratively coming up with solutions. As Mike says, all the evidence suggests that the most successful, innovative teams are those that are most diverse. Age, background, experience, training, more diverse the team is, the better it will perform. And it's about being active, because a desk is a pretty dangerous place from which to view the world. It doesn't really tell you how the world is. You need to get out and see how people experience things, as Philip did, as well as did shadowing um, the people coming in for appointments. And it's about visualising things as well, actually. That makes things really, really shareable and also helps it make it easy for people to understand. What do you think the average reading age is in Scotland? Seven. That's a bit pessimistic, but you're not far <laughs> off. No, it's nine. <laughs> The average reading age in Scotland is nine. I don't actually know what a really high reading age is. I mean, because you don't get you know, significantly better at reading when you're 75, do you? I guess it tails off somewhere around about 14. But the average reading age is nine. So everything that is communicated should be readable and understandable by a nine-year-old. But I don't think any of us are particularly good at doing that. But visualising things is a way of helping explain. <laughs> So service design is about designing all those end-to-end experiences that meet the needs of the people using the service and also of the people delivering a service. And it's about understanding what somebody's journey is from start to finish for both themselves and their carers and also what matters to them. So it's about co-design, it's about bringing people into the design process, not thinking that we know the answer, because our solution to someone else's problem isn't a solution for them. But if we can bring people, citizens, into the design of health and social care, we can design services that meet everybody's needs. 
But the key things that need to be in place for that to happen are leadership, and that's leadership at the very top that actually believes that including citizens in designing health and social care is valuable and is important, and also leadership of a collective nature at all levels of an organisation, people feeling empowered to be able to make changes. And about building a community <coughs> of people that think that's a valuable way to work. So it's not just the cool art school kids doing something, it's that you tap into everybody's creativity to make change happen. And building a capacity so that you're using simple and easy tools to do it, people can just pick up and use without spending great amounts of money. Mike's going to talk a little bit more about how that becomes embedded in organisations. Okay, so about five years ago this report came out and it was a report that pulled together research on about 70 different design-led projects in the public sector throughout Europe. And it tried to make sense of it and it tried to explain, okay, if we're going to use design, service design, strategically, um, what are the different, what are the different uh, paths or different steps that we can take? Design for Public Good, and if you Google Design for Public Good, you can download the, uh, the whole book. And it essentially says, to summarise the key thing, it says there's three steps in the use of design in the public sector. Step one is design for discrete problems. Step two is design as capability. The organisations build up within them the capability of being creative and using design. And step three is design for policy where design actually is about policy making and design is at the highest levels of governance within those organisations. So, just finally in my bit, some of examples of that and actually here at Nine Wells you have a brilliant example of design for discrete problems. The work that um, I think graphic design and interior design students did in your A&E department is fantastic. You are facing the problem of people in A&E are confused, are worried, are anxious, are upset, don't know where they are, don't know how the system works. Okay, these people have come in after me and actually they're being seen by the doctor first. Why, why is that happening? Why isn't there a queue system? So this explains why there isn't a queue system. This explains how it works. This explains the different kinds of uniforms that people are wearing and what that says. And it reduces that anxiety. Lots of other things happening there as well. The Design Bugs Out project that the London-based Design Council did, which was about how do you design furniture and fittings in a hospital to reduce um, infection. Great example of that. Let's go up a step. Designers' capability. The workshops that Rod Hazel and I and others have run on empathy mapping through NES, uh, trying to get GPs and others using em empathy mapping as a tool within medical practice. Um, some of the workshops that we've run here for GPs on how you could use creative methods and design idea generation methods in, uh, in your GP practice. Design for policy is where it gets really interesting. So I don't know if you heard of the Policy Lab. Policy Lab is part of Cabinet Office in London. And they are responsible for using design and other creative methods right across um, government departments in Whitehall. Um, so how at the highest level of, of government can design thinking be used to address policy? Um, and also to address policy across the silos of government. So that's an interesting example, using it strategically. Um, and also there are similar examples throughout Europe, but closer to home in Scotland, we have this. Have you heard of this? The Scottish approach to service design. Some of you have heard about. This is being led by the Office of the Chief Designer in Scottish Government. Um, the Office of the Chief Designer in Scottish Government, they're not responsible for letter headings or notices. They're responsible for strategy and policy of government. And the aspiration of the Scottish Government is that the Scottish approach to service design will infuse everything that the Scottish Government funds from small projects through to NHS Scotland. And they have a timetable for that. 
This started just a couple of years ago when it was scoping out how is service design being used in Scotland in, in public services in the public sector. What's work, what's working, what's broken, uh, broken, etc. And then they have developed a training program which is going on. They are developing tools and methods. And from 2020 onwards, it's about scaling up and infusing it across the entire uh, public sector in Scotland so that service design is something that not only addresses those discrete problems, is not only something that is about building up the creative capacities and capabilities of uh, the public sector, but is also about using design as a means of making policy at the highest level. Rod. Thank you so much. I hope that gives you a flavour for what service design is and what it can do. I think we have a real opportunity in Tayside to do something special using the skills and tools that um, people like Mike and Hazel bring to us. When you look at um, the wider design environment and what we can do in healthcare, it's huge. It's exciting. Um, and what we've had is a wonderful opportunity together with VNA Dundee to just start a conversation, and hopefully a conversation that's going to go on for a long while yet. Um, I've been learning all about design and, and trying to work out what designers actually do, what, is the, 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 what are the tools and the mindset that is required to think like a designer, and very, very simplistically, and I hope I'm not offending some of the designers in the audience here, I think it's a, a three-phase process. Um, it's helping people visualize the future through sketching, through drawing, through visualizing it, then taking it up a level and actually prototyping it, testing it out, testing it out often on a small scale to see if, it, if something actually works. The really important step is that before this all takes place, designers will spend time with their users and get lots of other disciplines together. All the stuff we've been talking about this morning. So it's always coming back to that first step that we always forget about, well, I forget about as a healthcare professional. And I've broken that down into three steps. It's empathy, spending time with people, getting in their shoes, listening to them, seeing what matters to them in their lives. And then the task for us is creating a journey for them that is going to take them through as seamlessly as possible through a very complex system that we have to run as health or social care workers and looking at outcomes that matter to them. So I think this three-stage process is just a, a nice simple way of think, thinking for us that work in the, in the healthcare world. Um, I was very lucky to meet up with Philip Long who's been the, the drive behind VNA Dundee two or three years ago and we went on a walkabout around Nine Wells Hospital and we had a conversation and looked at what could healthcare design be and it was such fun, it just opened our eyes to the scope of design that's followed on to real engagement with VNA Dundee and a group of us that have been lucky enough to try and have a first go. This is all just a start of a journey on trying to describe what healthcare design is all about. And I've, I've put together two pages in the, uh, the story of Scottish design. Uh, some of you might have seen this in, in the museum, which just starts to describe what design is and what it can be in the future. Um, and I thought I'd just share some of these. Um, how many of you have been in our Maggie Centre in Dundee? What do you think? It's just wonderful. I mean, that to me is just fantastic. Architectural design, and more importantly, the interior design of that space is fantastic. There's a term called kitchenism that has crept into the Maggie centres, um, centres around Scotland, and you feel as if you're walking into somebody's living room or into their kitchen, a warm, welcoming space. So I think architecture and interior design is incredibly important. Um, in, in health and social care. We've got some great history and trying to tell the Scottish people that have been involved in design. It, they, we've only got a few names in the museum but there are a lot more out there that we'd just love to bring in through the years. The obvious person in our world is Sir Alfred Kashiri and the design of keyhole surgery instruments that we all use. 
the really interesting discussion that I've had with Sir Alfred about design is that he thinks the biggest contribution he's made is to the training, the skills training facilities that he set up in order to provide a process and a journey where people could be trained to use these devices safely. It's really interesting. That's his legacy and design, uh, his perspective on it. Um, we've got another bit of history locally here. Um, the laryngoscope. How many of you have had a general anaesthetic before? A horrible thing like this would have been used on the... I see Barry in the back there is an anaesthetist. This is a laryngoscope, and it's used to get your tongue out the way so the anaesthetist can put a tube in. Now, Matt McGrath was a designer from art college, took up a challenge to redesign the laryngoscope, and the laryngoscope, the new modern design of the laryngoscope is in VNA Dundee. Barry Maguire, Barry, put your hand up here. <laughs> Barry had a big part to play in that design process. Would I be right, Barry? They're just the user... Yeah. All the real user interface stuff to make something that would be useful to you guys to use. And it's now become a fantastic teaching tool. I'll just pass that around so you, you can have a look at it. Um, the other device that we put in the VNA. How many of you have seen these in the little display in VNA Dundee? Yeah. The other really interesting one has come from Dundee from a medical student, Chris McCann. In his second year I met Chris and he went to the wards and he looked at what we do. How many of you have been in hospital and woken up repeatedly during the night to take your blood pressure, pulse, all that sort of stuff? All that stuff we have to do. Chris said, we can use technology to put something around your arm that will measure all that physiology, and it'll, it'll transmit it wirelessly to a device that the nursing team can keep an eye on and parameters set in it from a safety point of view uh, that will warn of your, if, you, if your health deteriorates. It's continuous monitoring. Our monitoring that we do at the moment is every four to six hours. This is much better. The real value of this is that this sort of monitoring is going to be able to follow the patient from hospital back into their home seamlessly. So this is fantastic technology. Chris has left med school <laughs> in the second year. He's got a company in Edinburgh, highly successful. He's got uh, the Mayo Clinic and people all over him with this, this new technology. Um, we've... We've got a fantastic opportunity in Dundee to really embrace um, in our uh, universities and our colleges, and particularly the creative components of our colleges. This is just, a, a, you, it doesn't show very well, but it's just the scope of art and design at Duncan of Jordanson. It's huge. And if any of you are interested in taking forward ideas that you have, creative ideas you have, we have a wonderful network now of people at DJ Cat, some of whom are with us today, that could help on, on that journey. Um, what are we doing? We um, have a lot of active projects as we speak uh, where art and design students are working with us in the hospital towards their degrees, but very usefully creating ideas that we can actually use in practical terms uh, in our hospitals and in the community. We're changing a style of working and really starting to engage properly with our patients. And this is an educational event. Um, that the, my style of, of teaching our trainees now is rather than standing up with a PowerPoint presentation, is getting some of the patients into the room and spending the afternoon with them and listening to their stories and their journey and then building the education around it. It works. It, it's, a, it's a different way of doing things. We're getting our students involved, and I'd love to get the med school far more involved in, in what design's all about and the tools. I think this would be a very useful long-term set of tools and strategies for our medical students, nursing students. Um, we've got a few of our quality improvements people here in the audience. Huh? Yeah. I think we, we very historically in, in healthcare, we've been good at audits. Quality improvement has come in and made a step change to improving that, I think we can go a step further and start bringing design principles and adding that to quality improvement. And then we'll have something really special in Tayside, something that not many people elsewhere are doing. Um, this is a live project in the acute medical unit. Anybody from the AMU here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Sorry, I wasn't looking left. <laughs> That's just been brilliant in um, helping 
us redesign the acute medical unit, probably one of the most stressful places in this hospital to work in. And a lot of good ideas, would I be right, that are coming through from students? Yeah, just getting a fresh set of eyes is really important. Fresh set of eyes. That's what a lot of this is all about. Um, not our eyes looking at, at, at problem solving. Um, projects for this year, next year, the pediatric theatre project that is, is going to become live and real. We've a huge element of design input there coming from students again that are, that are helping. We are going to redesign the Nine Worlds Concourse. <laughs> woo <Woo-hoo! laughs> and, and can you please just... We, we are really, if, before I leave this hospital, that's something I really want to do. <laughs> so please, uh, if anybody wants to help out, please do, because I'm embarrassed walking into this place. Um, we need to change it. The other is a project that is live and will hopefully be there for you to see maybe in the next few months, is that we're linking the inside with our wonderful outside spaces. The community gardens, the Maggie Centre, places where people go for a walk in the forest at lunchtime. We're going to visualise that for people and show them how to actually get out to these spaces. So these are all live projects. There's some great projects going on. Um, Fiona Robertson, Fiona, are you here? I don't, Fiona's going to struggle to get here. Some really great product design stuff that is coming through. Fiona's a therapeutic radiographer at Nine Wells. And if you have radiotherapy, head and neck radiotherapy, the stuff I am involved in, you have to have a big, warm, thermoplastic thing molded to your face. And then every t- to your body, every time you have your radiotherapy, you pin down in this thing. It's scary. Um, Fiona's come up with the idea that you can just 3D scan my face and then create a 3D mask that is me. It's not just a, it's made to the shape of my face with spaces to breathe through, to look through, to get away from that claustrophobic problem. And this is really taking off and it's gonna be another great product that has come out of uh, uh, innovation from our, our, our hospital. Uh, another great project that is live and will uh, hopefully be realized quite so- soon is looking at the waiting area at Roxburgh House. And this is a project done um, with VNA Dundee and Macmillan working together. And the really great thing about this project is that a lot of the design has come from people at the end of their lives being cared for in, in Roxburgh House. The ideas have been generated by them. Just a wonderful project. Um, where do I hope we go in the future? I would love to have what Imperial College has, and that's a space that is, sits just outside Imperial College called the Helix. And this is a space where citizens can get together, designers, all these ideas can actually be prototyped and tested out in a lovely space where people can come together. We'll hopefully get this in the future. Um, so that's our chat. And um, I would love to, I think we have a few minutes to field a few questions. Within Nine Wells, the Academic Health Science Partnership sits upstairs on level 10, and I'm part of the quality improvement and design team. If any of you have great ideas, please bring them to us, and we'll try and help take them forward with you um, and try and find people to collaborate with you. And uh, Mike and Hazel, this is where you can track them down. Um, I'm part of their team as well now, so I think between the three of us, if you've got ideas that have a design theme, to them, please come to us. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, where would you like to see this all going from a personal point of view? I'm saying I'd like to see it connected to the, the work that we need to do around person-centred um, culture development and care. Um, we've got a government who wants to put artifactual things in place, so we tick the box. We ask what matters to you, we've ticked the box. What are we doing with that information? So if we can 
connect it to our education of our undergraduates and our existing staff. I think it's really important to do that. Debbie, thank you very much. And I think it, it, you nailed a word there. It's about a sort of cultural change in our organisation. And I think we have got an opportunity. There is a cultural change going on as we speak within our organisation and getting ideas generated just much like yours. So, yeah, love to support that. There's one hand at the back. Maybe it's a bit of a niche question, but um, you've spoken about getting the trainees in ENT involved in this kind of patient-centred design. Is there any chat with the deanery about getting it uh, made part of the curriculum for juniors, perhaps, who have to do two years here? Because um, I know quality improvement projects is part of our curriculum, but nothing about patient-centred design. Is it too new, or is there no chat about it? Brilliant question, and one that I would love to make this part of our curriculum. I need to speak to our medical school colleagues. Can you, you use the clip-on mic so that we, we can right. capture it for the uh, video as well? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I have a question will follow on to yeah. the obvious Thanks very much. I don't have a question. It's more a, a trailer. Um, we, we're working with, with Mike and Hazel as part of the undergraduate curriculum review. Uh, so if any of this has inspired you and you want to get involved with talking about this in an undergraduate education context, please get in touch with us. Thank you. Anyone else over here? Thank you. Um, how many actual new ideas are really needed and how much is it that other people have had the ideas in other places and we just haven't noticed them? You know, if you actually reinvent everything from scratch, are you going to end up spending a lot of time? That's good. I mean, that's a really good point and a really good question. Um, there is, a, yeah, there's lots of good practice happening elsewhere and it's that key thing about leadership community and capacity you know we will work all over Scotland and there's fantastic things happening in Ayrshire and Arran health board that nobody's heard about in Highland you know and or there's a project that started in NHS Lothian and then the person leaves and it all just withers away so it is also you know being able to scan and see what's out there but it's also about having things that fit particular contexts you know, and that actually people buy into and want to work. So it's a combination of those two things. Yeah, it's not reinventing the wheel, but it's also making sure that things fit to particular contexts. It's a really important point because back in sept this September, the Health Foundation came out with a report that was saying actually there's no shortage of innovation in the NHS. The problem in the NHS is the dissemination and the sharing of that innovation. That in itself is a, is a design problem. Does finance, if anything, you know, does that create a problem? Because all these new innovations are fantastic, but they do cost money. And the cash-strapped NHS yeah. at the moment, is that going to have an yeah. effect on it? There's an interesting, yeah, there's an interesting balance between that when you're bringing in new te technology, etc. There's costs up front. But a lot of these ideas save money. You know, for example, the appointment letter, if you can get people to appointments and reduce the did-not-attends, you know, you just have better outcomes. Yeah, and, and that's what often is the problem is the short term view of trying to save money yeah you're absolutely right yeah I would just wanted to add on to the idea of the undergraduate programmes and a lot of the journey for patients most of their contact will be through nursing and other forms of care and things and just you know ensuring that nursing training is included in that process as well yeah that's a great point thanks Julie just going back to that uh, question about money and finance Two hours ago, the OECD produced their health report, their review of the year, and have you any idea how much mental health costs us in the UK? £94 billion pounds a year. So that's the cost of mental health, just of mental health. So we have to be applying creativity and innovation to that area, otherwise that bill is just going to rocket. And no economy, no economy can sustain that kind of cost. Is there, anybody, is there anybody in here that's actually from any of the drug service or the mental health services today? Out of curiosity. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, from the improvement team, uh, we're always interested in how this uh, affects joy at work, of course for patients as well, but for staff, because the main thing is time to release. But obviously with the turnout today, have you found that this has actually been quite an enabler for frontline teams to work in this way? It's new, it's creative. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've not done enough yet. This is just a start, and I think it is finding proper periods of time to do this well. To my mind, good design will take us time. It's not the, um, the immediate problems we face as this organization. And looking at the strategy, it's more medium and long term. And it, it does take time to do it properly. And you're talking about weeks, months to actually design something well. And that, that's, that's a mindset change that we need to get our leadership to buy into. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Just getting back to the, the financial aspects of things. So it must be fairly trivial to evaluate this. Have you, have you built evaluation into this to prove that these things are very well worth doing? Is, do we have examples of that yet? There's a, there's a large number of studies which have tried to evaluate what's the cost benefit in terms of investment in design, in terms of health outcomes, etc. And that research uh, consistently shows that there's a, a positive outcome. Um, so all the research is there, and it's a question of, again, how do we apply that? How do we make best use of it to have an impact on those areas that we think are priorities? Um, j just looking at the slide you, that had uh, democratising conversations, so I've, I've had some involvement in some co-design and it felt to me that the key feature was it took the expertise out of the room. So um, there was very clear sharing of problems. Everyone was equally uncomfortable with the creativity component and that was a great leveller so you could speak to each other as human beings and it took all the power hierarchies out. Could you maybe say a wee bit about that, the co in the co-design bit and how key that is to the projects you've been involved in? It's been absolutely key. Because, I mean, as you all know, um, when you get a room of people together like this, it's the people that are used to talking and the people that are comfortable talking that will ask the questions and the quiet voices are never heard. Um, and yet the quiet voices perhaps have the most experience and have things to bring. So that's a really crucial part of a co-design process is actually using other ways of people communicating. That's the whole thing about post-its and sharpies. Quiet people can write things down, can draw things, can contribute in a way that they would never stand up and say in front of what appears to be a more highly educated more experienced audience and yet those insights can be the things that actually flip things because we're, you know, we're all used to looking at the same problems and think they're you know, intractable but somebody who's actually experienced them can come up with some really simple things that are very low cost that actually just flip the whole thing whether it's just writing uh, an appointment letter in a way that's clear and easy to understand that means you bring your child to hospital at the right time and can comply with the advice that you're given. But it's very difficult to see that unless you actually look at it from the patient's point of view, of the person's point of view. So having them in and sharing that experience is really, really powerful. And actually hearing it from someone's ex lived experience, you can't unknow it and you have to do something about it. Anybody else? Good. Well, thank you so much for coming along. I mean, I think this has just been great seeing a complete, you know, a lovely, diverse group of people here. Let's try and keep this conversation going. Um, please, please get in touch. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot we can do in the years to come. Thank you.